Hello and welcome to lecture number three, The Theater of Hellenistic Greece. First, a little historical context. So about 325 BC, around that time, the world got bigger thanks to Alexander the Great. Athenian theater declined in quality as outside cultural influences intruded. Now Athens did flourish for some time under Alexander the Great and under the Romans. However, after about 600 years, Christianity uh, became more popular in the Roman Empire and the schools of philosophy were shut down by the Christian Emperor Justinian. They were considered much too pagan. Alexander the Great, what about him? Well, he was one of the greatest uh, conquerors the world has ever known. Uh, the end of independent Greece came with the ascendancy of him in 326 BC when he succeeded his father at the age of 19. In a 13 year period, he conquered most of the known world, uh, known to Greeks, that is. You can see, let's see, right here, oh, where am I? Here, here's the island of Greece, and then he just cut a swath all through here and ended up in the Far East, which he loved dearly. Uh, so he got defeated Persia, conquered Egypt. Remember we talked about Egypt being 3,000-year-old um, civilization. This was the end of it. Asia Minor all the way to India. And he died suddenly at age 32 from a sudden fever. It is hypothesized that he was either poisoned or overdosed on a medical herb called white hellebore. He was a very cosmopolitan ruler. He loved Persian culture. Big fan of Asian culture, too. I believe he took an Asian wife, as a matter of fact. Um, he tried to impose this culture on the Greeks, but it wasn't very successful. However, he did get many a young, talented man to leave Greece and be exposed to world, uh, world travel, exotic places, and then come back with a broadened worldview. In turn, these men spread Greek culture to all parts of the empire, from India all the way back to uh, Italy. So the term Hellenistic Greece refers to the period from the reign of Alexander until the Roman conquest of Greece in 149 BC, roughly a period of 200 years. Now here's the thing, Alexander refused to name an heir and that doomed his empire. So after his death, there were a number of many kings or many, em many emperors, when I say many, I mean M-I-N-I, -I, not M-A-N-Y, even though there were many, many emperors. I hope that makes some sort of sense. They fought each other, they fought each other, they fought each other until they were finally absorbed by the Roman Empire who just scooped them all up and said, you're Romans now. But you can look at this map, you can see all these little empires all over. It was a mess. Okay, so let's talk about Greek theater after the Golden Age, about the time Aristotle was putting the finishing touches on the poetics. Um, the city Dionysia, for the time being, was the chief purveyor of Greek tragedy. They added a, a category for revivals of tragedies, mostly tragedies from the 5th century BC, which again is about 150 to 200 years earlier. Acting was becoming more important. It's beginning to overshadow playwriting. Also, in 350 BC, rules for tragic actors changed. The three leading actors had to appear in one play by each of the three competing poets, so that there would not be any sort of bias shown. If you had a really good actor, um, you know, you had a, a, a Bradley Cooper or a um, Daniel Day-Lewis, you know, and the others didn't have that, had a Jim Belushi or somebody, no offense against Jim Belushi, then that wasn't seen as fair. So the top actor, the George Clooney, had to be in a play by each of the three poets. Comedy grew in popularity. This is the period of middle comedy, as it's known by historians. It's a moving away from satire. Uh, mostly focusing on everyday life and social mores. So we still have some uh, burlesque antics of old comedy and the satyr plays, but we're starting to see more of a more refined, sort of sophisticated comedy. We only have two extant scripts, The Assemblywomen and Plutus. Both are comedy of manners with greatly reduced roles for the chorus, and both are some of the last plays by Aristophanes. So again, the only comedy we have is coming from one person. As for tragedy, there were successful, respected poets, but none really reached the magnitude of the big three of the Golden Age. After the Golden Age, uh, in the 4th century BC, Rhesus is the only play we have extant, and we're not sure who wrote it. Probably Euripides. So it's based on a book by the Iliad, 
and is noteworthy because the entire play, play takes place at night. So you see new innovations are happening. So let's talk, uh, focus just a bit on tragedy in Hellenistic Greece. Um, at some point in his ascendancy, Alexander assembled three assembled three thousand actors for a victory celebration. This set a precedent for thereafter his rulers, his successors of all those states, would uh, hold secular festivals celebrating victories, major events, or just their birthday. So we see that going on. We also see a wider worldview, increasing secularism. So we're getting away from this idea that, you know, these the gods are doing things. It's more about everyday life. <clears throat> what does this mean? That performances are not just limited to religious festivals anymore. So that means that we can seen by a wider audience. The city of Dionysus is still held, but it's had to compete with an increasing number of secular festivals. And these festivals were very popular. And the people going to these festivals weren't really interested in classical tragedies. So they start to diminish in quality and popularity. And pretty much the myth they were based on, that's a finite subject matter. It had been pretty much mined out. So we really don't need, really don't need another um, play about Oedipus or Medea or Antigone or Agamemnon. Okay. Uh, so we don't have any new tragedies at this era. Seder plays are about all gone. Like I said, it's a more broad world view, more cosmopolitan, and they're just not, they're just not appropriate anymore. Good Lord, they're just so juvenile. No, thank you. New comedy. Ah, on the other hand, comedy grew in popularity and widely performed through the Hellenistic worlds. This is the era of new comedy. It is defined as comedy of everyday life with concerns of love, money, family, societal concerns. Um, it's possible that new comedy was started with Euripides because a number of his later plays were tragic comedies and made use of plots such as long lost children and scenes of recognition, which, as you see through this course and the next, that, that will become a very popular theme throughout the history of Western theater. At the city Dionysia, these tragic comic plays replaced satyr plays as the fourth play of the tetralogy. Very popular. Uh, Consider them today like a, a modern sitcom. Modern Family comes to mind, would probably be more in the lines of new comedy. Lots of mistaken and concealed identities, very characteristic of new comedy. Uh, a common element was the plot device of a boy in love with a girl, and they must go through a series of comic mishaps before they can ever have happiness together. More often than not, the lover was a slave, or lower, one of the lovers was a slave or lower class character. But in the end, he or she turns out to be the long lost child of a wealthy merchant or a respected aristocrat. Now, generally, the scripts for New Comedy start with a prologue setting forth the premise, followed by a series of wacky episodes separated by choral interludes. Oftentimes, this is the only time the chorus would appear on stage. Here's a simple plot. Wealthy young man seeks to marry a poor or enslaved girl against the wishes of his father. After a series of comic obstacles, the son obtains his goal. It is revealed that the girl is the long-lost daughter of an influential citizen. There is a scene of recognition and reconciliation, and all ends well. Does that not sound familiar like just about every comedy ever? Now, we have a number of stock characters associated with new comedy. We're not going to go through all of them. Um, the Greek lexicogra lexicographer Pollux categorized nine types of old men, four of young men, seven of slaves, five of young women, as well as various soldiers, parasites, and so on. So there's so many, we're not going to, let's say, go into it. Uh, when we cover Commedia dell'arte in the Italian Renaissance area, we'll, we'll sort of focus on some of these, uh, some of their stock characters who kind of came out of this new comedy um, catalog. Uh, we know the names of 64 new com comedy poets, and we know that at least 1,400 plays were produced in this period. But how many do we have with us? How many complete strips? One, the Dioscolus, or the Grouch, by Menander. Quick bit about Mr. Menander. Well, just Menander, thank you very much. Um, we have a lot of lengthy fragments, but only one complete script. And he's important not only because he has the only script, but because of his legacy. Not only was he admired by Greeks, but the Romans as well. They hailed him in higher regard than any other Greek writer except for Homer. And after Menander, as Greece became more cosmopolitan, Greek comedy declined and gave way to more Roman-influenced Roman theater forms, which we will see in the next lecture. 
And we have the discolus because a manuscript was discovered in 1957. We think it was written around 317 BC. So that would put it pretty much right after the death, around the death of Alexander the Great. To give you an idea of what we think new comedy uh, basic plots, characteristic plots were like, here's a quick synopsis of the discolus or the grouch. The play is set in motion by the mischievous Pan, who makes young Sostratos, Sostratos fall in love with a peasant girl he has glimpsed. Sostratos, hard to say by the way, sends his servant to see the girl's father, Naaman, a misanthropic farmer who becomes enraged at anyone who ventures onto his land. Sostratos enlists Naaman's stepson, Georgius, in getting Naaman to allow Sostratos to wed his daughter. According to Georgius, Naaman has a vow that he will permit only a man like himself to marry his daughter. Therefore, Sostratos, a gentleman, uh, dons a rough sheepskin coat and sets to work nearby as a laborer. Naaman falls down his own well. Uh-oh. Georgius jumps in to rescue him. Having nearly drowned and believing himself about to die, Naaman sees the error of his ways and tells Georgius to find a husband for his sister. Georgius happens to know of this nice young man named Sostratos, who he introduces to Naaman, who gives his approval. Not done yet. Uh, oops, I'm sorry, that's already, uh, we already know that part, that was left over from before. The jubilant Sostratos tells his own father, Callipides, of the wedding plan and suggests a second marriage between Georgius and Sostratos' sister. Callipides balks at this, thinking, maybe I don't want two paupers in my family, but is immediately persuaded when Sostratos reminds him that immortality comes through generosity, not through the hoarding of wealth. At the celebration that follows, the recovered Naaman awakes from his sleep as cantankerous as ever, but is crowned with a wreath of flowers and admonished as the play ends in dancing and song. So you can see, not a satire like Lysistrata or The Birds, but more of a family matter. Let's talk about the actors for a moment, because they're very important in this uh, era. Um, theater this time becomes more and more focused on the actors. Uh, Audiences now are more liable to go see a favorite performer than they are to see a new play by a poet. So, there, and because there were theaters throughout the Hellenistic world, there were ample opportunities for actors. It was now possible to make a living as a performer. It was an explosion of actors, and they were very popular. In fact, in 277 BC, in Athens, actors formed the first union. So, uh, it was called the, a guild called the Artists of Dionysus. It included the poets, chorus members, and other theater personnel. So it's kind of like Actors' Equity, the union we have today. Meanwhile, at the city Dionysia, the Koragos disappeared. Remember, that was the producer, the wealthy citizen, because we don't have as much wealth in Athens. It is, is deteriorated somewhat, so it's harder to get citizens wealthy enough to help shoulder the burden of production costs. So the city took over all the costs of producing festival plays, and a government official called the Agenthetes handled details and covered production costs. Now, let's go back to the Artists of Dionysus for a second. They were very useful for ne ne negotiating contracts across kingdom borders after the death of Alexander. Uh, they were guaranteed safe passage in times of war, and they were exempt from military service. But you could not stay in one place. The only way you're gonna make a living as an actor is to travel and to tour which is kind of true today, actually. They became very powerful organization. They could book engagements, they would make travel arrangements, they would negotiate contracts. They would also provide actors to act as ambassadors to negotiate peace between war and kingdom. So, you know, they were in some high regard in that sense. Um, they developed a contract where three actors, along with a small tech staff, would tour a circuit of Hellenistic theaters likely performing from a repertoire of classic tragedy and new comedy plays. So they would go from town to town, from kingdom to kingdom, and say, here's a list of our plays, what would you like to see? But there was no chorus, so local theater clubs would be uh, enlisted to add choral interludes, interludes, known as the imbolima, comprised of local favorites. So it's interesting to note that even in the Hellenistic era, we still have community theater. The songs of the imbolima were placed at four animal intervals in the play giving the headline actors a break. This would eventually become the five-act structure, which we'll see in Roman and Renaissance drama. And Shakespeare. Well, Shakespeare's Renaissance drama, so. Um, usually, they were chosen by the local performers and didn't have very much relationship to the play being performed. They were, like I said, little intermission acts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, popular actors could get large stipends for appearing in a play. 
We know there were huge stars, such as Polis, Neoptolemus, Theodorus, who could pack any theater they played. So we're starting to see this is the first time we see the power of a performer to draw a crowd. They still wore masks, so it was still judged by vocal qualities, particularly feats of vocal virtuosity and the ability to command, convey emotion with their voices. So, and they, this time, they, at this point, they had much more power than the writers and would often change the text to suit their particular skills. And even though they were praised and admired, they were not high up on that social ladder. Even Aristotle considered them disreputable. Plato, Plato argued for the strict censorship of theater to keep actors from gaining the upper hand in society. Don't let those people talk. They'll persuade you to do bad things. A uh, quick page on masks here. They became more sophisticated, so we don't have as exaggerated a face, faces of old comedy and old tragedy, much more realistic likenesses. You can see here some mask molds. Like in the Greek era, tragically, there are no masks that have survived. Um, old men as slaves were slightly exaggerated, were intentionally ugly. Young lovers were portrayed as realistic and good looking. Tragic masks were portrayed with realistic likenesses, with less of the stylism of the old Greek tragic masks. You can see a couple here. The lower one seems to be a lover. Uh, that's a handsome mask there, probably a young woman. One of the two lovers who would be at the center of any, any new comedy script. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the architecture. It's still the same format, the theatron or audience, the orchestra, and the skene. But there are some changes, particularly with the skene. Remember the Periskenia here? Periskenia, excuse me. The two kind of outlier buildings like that. This is kind of a representation. Um, those are gone. Those are gone now in Hellenistic theater. It's replaced by this huge raised stage. 8 to 12 feet high, as much as 140 feet long and 12 to 14 feet deep. So in front of the stage, you have a, you still have a lower story, you can see here, um, with a central doorway. Oops, I'm sorry, I covered up that guy. He gives you an excellent sense of scale. You can see this little fella here. So it's a really big stage area. Um, anyway, you have the front edge there. That's, the, um, that's called the Proskenian. So, proscenium, proscenium, coincidence? I don't think so. The second story is called the Episcenian, and it rose about 12 to 16 feet high at the top with a low-pitched or flat roof. The proscenium was made up of pillars, some notched to hold pinakis. It is believed that the orchestra was used as the main acting area, and the upper stage was reserved for special scenes. Sorry if you can hear the um, train in the background. Not my doing. Later on, the upper stage became the main playing area. The orchestra became a vestigial area no longer really used. Um, the Proskenian became an open colonnade. So now upstairs, you can see we'll go back up here. This this area is um, has one to seven doorways. This one has seven. Eight feet wide, eight to 12 feet high. These are called the Thyromata. Good answer. There's some evidence that scenes were placed in the Thyromata and served as many, many proscenium stages. It is also believed that periactoi containing stock scenes were placed inside the Thyromata. So that's what these are. You can see, you can have a scene, you can put a whole setting behind there, and you just turn that periactoi, and voila, you've got another scene. The Theater of Dionysus finally became a permanent structure in the Hellenistic Age. The whole time it really wasn't. It was just kind of adapted and repaired as needed. So, and when it was built, though, when it was finally built permanently, it followed the conventions of the Hellenistic Theater building. Okay, one last thing, postscripts about mimes, and it's a good thing we're ending because somebody's starting to mow their lawn outside. As we move closer to the first century AD, we start to see Roman culture become more influ influential, and this is mostly because of the advent of the mimes, which we'll talk about when we do the Romans. Um, very popular as we start to get close to the first century. Now, when we say mime in this sense, we're not talking about like Marcel Marceau, or as I had mentioned in class last week, artist, somebody trying to get out of an invisible box. This is basically a street performer um, doing mimetic dances, imitations, improv, sketches, skits, acrobatics, juggling. 
for just about any other thing that somebody would come to see. So, again, think of it as America's Got Talent. Uh, and it was very popular. And um, you will start to see when we do the Romans that mimes will be very influential performers. They traveled in troops. They set up temporary wooden stages to perform on. They performed at markets, festivals, banquets, even set up on a street corner. Um, now, they were looked down upon by legitimate actors, and they were not allowed to be in the arts of Dionysia. They were considered unworthy because, one, they allowed women in their troop. What's up with that? And they performed without masks, which is basically a blasphemy. Now, in southern Italy, there were these mimes called the Phylakis, who were extremely popular. Uh, we don't know too much about them. We know there is one of them, a mime named Renthon, who wrote comic burlesque. Now, it was the Phylakis that the Romans first came across when they started expanding out as an empire. And they were very influential on Roman theater. Um, and also the Romans absorbed the Hellenistic love for burlesque and comedy. But this isn't about the Romans. This is the Hellenistic theater, and we are now done. So thank you for listening.